Thank you, Danielle, and good uh, afternoon to everyone who is uh, listening to this live. Uh, the topic today is thickness maps, and uh, I'll talk about uh, why they're important, how we generate them. And uh, there's a couple of images here. They'll appear later in the lecture, so uh, I'll just uh, move on. Oh. Uh, this is the uh, slide I um, usually start out with. Uh, it's about the terms for use. Uh, essentially, uh, it says that uh, the intention is for the materials, the videos, the exercises, the lectures is for uh, students and those who uh, uh, professionally teach students. It's not intended for people already working, especially in the uh, energy industry. So a brief outline, three main points. Um, why generate a thickness map? Uh, why are they important? What is the uh, purpose of them? Uh, I'll talk about uh, different types of thickness maps and then a couple of words about how we actually generate time thickness maps. So uh, at this point in our analysis, we've uh, done our uh, seismic sequence analysis. We've broken out the main depositional packages. We've also identified and mapped the major uh, faults that offset our depositional packages. So we have our significant horizons mapped and we have our significant faults mapped. Uh, we're interested in trying to predict uh, for each of our key depositional sequences uh, the uh, ones that might be potential reservoir intervals, the ones that might be potential source intervals, uh, and or the ones that might be potential ceiling intervals. We'd like to know for uh, some of these, the key uh, sequences at least, what their environments of deposition are. So uh, EODs is environment of deposition. And if I know that a particular area was deposited as a uh, coastal plain, uh, then I might infer the types of lithologies. Or maybe it's a fluvial deposit or maybe it's a deep water deposit. So thickness maps, uh, of course, what they give us is the thickness uh, of the uh, interval or the sequence uh, as a function of uh, uh, distance around our study area. Uh, we can also use thickness maps to help us to determine what those environment of depositions might be and how the environments and the lithologies might vary across our study area. So uh, as an example, let's say we're looking at a depositional sequence that was deposited as, as part of a major uh, uh, delta system, uh, continental margin building out into a, a deeper water basin. The reservoir might exist where we have delta front sands and so if we can figure out where in our study area the delta front sands might lie, that would help us to identify a possible reservoir unit. So we can look at cross-sectional views of, and uh, interpret the depositional environments. Uh, we'll talk more about that, uh, uh, I believe, on the next uh, uh, lecture, which would be uh, Thursday on seismic sequences or se seismic facies analysis. And thickness maps can also greatly facilitate our interpretation of the environments of deposition. And I'll show examples of that. So uh, let's look at a particular case study. Uh, this comes from uh, offshore Australia. Uh, it's an area that had major deltaic deposition. Uh, the seismic reflections, I've uh, put some red lines to kind of emphasize the uh, the uh, red-orange, uh, uh, which would be the uh, troughs, uh, the black-grays would be the peaks. Uh, these uh, reflectors, uh, both from the green to magenta and just above magenta, are showing a progradational ge geometry where the delta is building basinward. So uh, land landward or updip is to the left, uh, basinward is to the right. And uh, after the deposition of these uh, two sequences, there was some post-depositional tilting and there was also some erosion. So if we look at this um, uh, interval, uh, I've uh, highlighted the uh, green sequence, uh, which is the sequence on top of the green sequence boundary and the magenta sequence sitting on top of the magenta sequence boundary. 
And here's where you can see some evidence for some downcutting uh, erosion uh, post-depositionally. We can use some terminology that was first coined by a gentleman named Rich back in 1950. Uh, and if, he, if you have a deltaic uh, package building out into relatively deep water, uh, it's thin up on the paleo shelf. And then as the unit is building into the basin, filling in uh, the paleo water depth, uh, you go from a, a region that Rich called the underform, which has uh, essentially a flat top uh, and uh, uh, in inclining uh, uh, lithophages, uh, uh, facies units, uh, the uh, uh, stratal packages, the stratal boundaries would be dipping down into the basin. Then you have a part uh, where you see the paleo slope, uh, that's called the clinoform, uh, and then out into the basin where the depositional rates are small or maybe we have no deposition, uh, that is what Rich called the fondoform. So we can look at a seismic line such as the one I showed. Here's the green sequence boundary, the magenta sequence boundary. Up here where it's relatively thin and everything is uh, fairly horizontally layered, that would be the underform. Then when we see the clinoforms that are building out, uh, these would represent paleo slopes during the time that this uh, unit was being deposited. That would be the clinoform. And then out uh, further basinward, uh, where it thins um, and uh, we're in a deeper water setting, uh, that would be the fondoform. So we can look at a, um, an area, either with 2D seismic or 3D seismic. We can try to uh, uh, interpret where these different uh, geometries are and put them into a map view. So this is an area with uh, 2D seismic uh, lines A through uh, H, I think. Um, and the color code orange would be the underform using uh, Rich's terminology. The yellow, let me go back a step. Uh, the yellow would be the underform where the top is uh, horizontal uh, before we have the, the paleo shelf margin and start to have the uh, paleo slope. So on the maps here, that would be in yellow. Then the brown would be from that uh, last shelf margin where we have the uh, paleo slope going out into the basin. And then the green would be the fondoform, the thin parallel units that's in uh, relatively deep water. And so what I've done here is I've taken these uh, about eight lines. I've uh, marked on them where I see the different geometries and then I've started to interpret some of the uh, depositional environments. So this uh, red dashed line would be the shelf margin at the very end of this depositional package. From red to green would be the latest uh, paleo slope. Uh, beyond this uh, black dotted line would be the basinal deposits. And then uh, landward of this dotted line would be where everything would be thin, uh, fluvial to shelf uh, type of deposition. So I've uh, placed that interpretation on here. Uh, fluvial coastal plain would be where the orange is shown. Uh, delta plain to delta front would be in the yellow. Delta slope is the brown. And basinal units, uh, probably shale, uh, is shown in the green. So if uh, uh, I use a model, a depositional model for a prograding delta, the cleanest sands are where the wave energy, either due to uh, normal uh, waves or due to uh, uh, severe storms, um, the uh, material uh, gets uh, um, uh, stirred up uh, and the coarser material uh, stays put and the finer material uh, gets winnowed out, gets carried further offshore. And so in this yellow band is where I would predict the best reservoir quality. So that uh, is interpreting the environments of deposition using some uh, 2D uh, profiles. I can also generate the thickness map, and this is in units of milliseconds, so it's two-way time. And a time thickness map we call an isochron. 
ISO uh, same as and cron for chronology or time. The thickest is in the, uh, the pinks, the oranges, and the yellows. And you can see near the last shelf margin is where we have the thickest uh, unit. And that uh, is what I would expect with a prograding deltaic type of package. So thin up where it's fluvial, thin out in the uh, deep water basinal deposits, thick along the uh, shelf margin that's building out during the deposition of this particular unit. So there's two basic types of thickness maps that we can generate. Uh, we can generate a true stratigraphic thickness map, and that's where we measure thickness perpendicular to the stratal layering. And then uh, the other type is a true vertical thickness, a TVT, or an isochore map. And that's where the thickness is measured vertically. Uh, and if the uh, beds have some sort of a dip or attitude, uh, a true vertical thickness would be different than the true stratigraphic thickness. And I'll show that on the next slide. So if our units are fairly horizontal, then the true stratigraphic thickness uh, measured perpendicular to the stratal uh, layering uh, would equal the true vertical thickness where we uh, get a measurement uh, uh, straight down from uh, top to bottom. However, if the units are dipping, the true stratigraphic thickness uh, would be at an angle. The true vertical thickness would be uh, straight down. You can imagine that this is a right triangle. The true vertical thickness is the hypotenuse. And so true vertical thickness will always be a little uh, larger in quantity than the true stratigraphic thickness. And if I know what the dip of these layers are, let's say it's at an angle theta, the true stratigraphic thickness is the true vertical thickness times cosine of that angle theta. There's two basic units that we use for thickness maps. It depends on the type of data that we have. Uh, the one type is a thickness map where we're measuring things in meters or in feet, uh, and that could be based on uh, measured sections. Uh, if we have an outcrop, it could be uh, based on well data, or it could be based on uh, wells with deviation, as long as we have the deviation sur survey. And we can correct those uh, if we have uh, dipping uh, beds to true vertical uh, depth. The other type of map uh, for people working with seismic data is a two-way time thickness. And so that would be in units of milliseconds as uh, was in the example on the previous slide. And that's based on um, measured time uh, difference between the top and base of a unit looking at seismic sections or seismic profiles. If our seismic data has not yet been seismically migrated, then when we measure thickness with seismic data, we are measuring close to true stratigraphic thickness. However, if the seismic data has been migrated, then we have repositioned the reflectors uh, to give them uh, close to what their true uh, orientation in the subsurface is, and we're getting close to true vertical thickness. So it depends on the type of uh, seismic data uh, that we're working with. And uh, I guess I should mention that uh, this is assuming that my seismic is still in units of two-way travel time. Uh, if the seismic has been processed uh, using a velocity model to convert from two-way travel time to depth in feet or meters, uh, then I would not be um, measuring things in units of uh, milliseconds, but I would be measuring thicknesses in terms of uh, feet or in terms of meters. So how do we generate these isochron maps? Uh, if we're doing this manually, uh, we might have two horizons. Uh, and if we take the two-way time of the deeper horizon, subtract the two-way time of the shallower horizon, that would give me the isochron. We can post those individual values on a base map and then contour them uh, either by hand or we could uh, input the uh, thickness uh, isochron numbers into the computer and have the computer contour it from us. Uh, if we want to computerize everything, 
then we could grid the two-way time values for the deeper horizon, then grid the two-way time values for the shallower horizon, and then perform a grid operation. We can take the grid of the deeper horizon, subtract the grid of the shallower horizon, and that would give me the a grid of the isochron or time thickness. And then we could have the computer, uh, given that isochron grid, generate contours at whatever contour interval we would like. There's an exercise uh, with this uh, particular lecture, and uh, we have the top of the latrobe, which is our main reservoir package in the uh, Gippsland Basin. The yellow is the base of the reservoir unit, and so if you were to do the exercise, you can uh, measure uh, the time thickness uh, from the uh, aqua horizon to the yellow horizon, record that value posted on a base map, uh, record the thickness here and here and here and here, uh, and uh, get enough points that you could contour the values up. So uh, this is an example. These are fictitious values. I didn't want to give away what the true thickness map looked like for those of you that want to work the exercise. But uh, given the, uh, the data that you have, uh, you have uh, about uh, seven uh, in lines that go north-south. You have about uh, seven or eight uh, cross lines that go east-west. You could get a thickness value at all of the line intersections and that should be enough data density. Uh, you write the numbers down, and then you can contour them up. So that uh, uh, concludes my remarks. This is a short lecture because uh, uh, part of the lecture time, if I were giving this course uh, in person, would be spent uh, going over the interpretation of uh, line C, which I talked about last week when we talked about uh, seismic uh, sequence analysis. And uh, it takes me at least 20 minutes to get through that. And so um, uh, we have a fairly short uh, lecture for the uh, thickness maps. So uh, I'll turn it back over to Dr. Sumi and see if uh, there are any questions. Great. Well, thank you. Um, yeah, as Fred mentioned, it's a short lecture today. Um, so if there's any questions, please write them in, in the questions box on the control panel. Um, and Fred's last slide here is just showing um, the upcoming agenda. So we're going to um, take a hiatus after October 3rd until the end of the month. So um, just to watch out for that. Um, and uh, Thursday I'll talk about seismic facies. We'll talk more about using seismic data to interpret environments of deposition. And then uh, a wonderful companion follow-on is uh, talking about seismic attributes. Great. Well, there haven't been any questions so far. Um, and yeah, so I think with that, we'll end very quickly today. Okay, very good. All right. Well, thanks well, to me for all your organization and uh, for moderating, and thanks sure. to all the members of my audience uh, for uh, uh, joining us uh, this afternoon. Great, thanks. We'll see you on Thursday. Okay. All right. Take care, everyone. Bye. Hey, bye-bye.